A uh, couple of notes of importance as well. Again, please, uh, if you're just joining us, turn off your cell phone. We are streaming this, and it will be available on websites at carolinapublicpress.org, at the uh, League of Women Voters site, which is ablwd.org, and also the NC Voter Education Project. And what is that site again? ncvotereducation.com? ncvotered.com. ncvotered.com. Uh, we also have one more forum after tonight. This is the third in the series of four. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for asking me to moderate, but also, more importantly, for putting these things on. It's really, really important. Too often, people go to the booth uneducated without knowing, really, they, they know based on what they hear or what they think. But here's your opportunity to get answers to the questions that you want. We have one more forum, and that is next week, on the 15th, also Monday, 6.30, it is for Buncombe County Commission District 3 and State House District 116. It will take place at the Skyland uh, Volunteer Fire Department on Miller Road. That is where Long Shoals meets Hendersonville Road. So that will be the last forum of this series. All right, we're going to go ahead and start, and we'll start with you, uh, Ms. Frost. Ellen Frost, Mike Fryer, Christina Kelly Merrill, and Carol Weir Peterson. Ms. Frost. Yes, my name is Ellen Frost, and first I want to take a, a second just to thank the League and all the media for being here. I think voter awareness is of, of utmost importance. I am a small business owner from Black Mountain. I have moved uh, to North Carolina in 1995. I'm a mother and grandmother. I adore Buncombe County, and I adore children, and that's why I chose to run for county commission. I've been a small business owner all my life. I talk the talk and walk the walk. I believe in a living wage, and all of our employees at Ben Biscuit are paid a living wage and have health benefits. I think education and economic development is what will drive our county forward, and I think we need to do everything we can to encourage jobs and also protect the environment and change the paradigm so that it's not just a job, but it's a living wage job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. Thank you, for, for having me here. My name is Mike Fryer. Uh, I have a beautiful life to have an audience that's put maybe 40 years here in a few more days. So uh, I appreciate her. I have two daughters. I've been in Buncombe County for 49 years. I've, I've been a businessman for 32 years in Buncombe County. I had a stock car racing engine business, and now I just basically hope to sell automobiles. But uh, I built stock car motors for 20 something years. I was in racing for over 30 something years. So, uh, as far as bringing education, I think education is we have to have it. But the simple fact is, we're, everybody can't be educated to pour concrete, everybody can't be educated to work on automobiles. Uh, there's technical schools, but then you have schools like I went to. A gentleman named Banjo Matthews. I went to work for him for three dollars a quarter an hour. I learned how to build race cars, how to build race engines, and uh, went in business myself in 1980. So uh, I want to support the schools. I want to support the kids, 140 uh, percent. But the, the fact is, in, in times we have to watch where the money goes. And right now, you know, I was talking a minute ago about Raleigh. When the stimulus went away, money went away. They had two years worth of stimulus money. So, as Nathan says, the government can print money, the state can't, and neither can the county. So, I want to support the kids, but uh, there's other things that children need to do. Because a lot of educated people are sitting at home. Thank you. There's a second microphone as well, so we can kind of share. Let's get on. Sorry, Ms. Merrill. I know. Okay. Christina Kelly. <laughs> that is fine. I, I just want to thank everyone also for giving us this opportunity to express the reasons why we're running for county commissioner. My name is Christina Kelly Merrill, and I've lived in Buncombe County for nearly two decades. I moved from Southern California, where I went to Pepperdine University and worked as a reporter for ABC and um, KFWB in Los Angeles. I found myself a single mother unexpectedly with a, a two-year-old and a five-year-old and was looking for a better place to raise my children by myself. So I sent several takes out, got a job here, 
and moved across the USA as a single mom with two little boys and was so impressed with the affordable cost of living, the wonderful, genuine people, and the amazing schools. I had a, a son who was uh, told, that I was told in California was just gonna fall through the cracks. Well, our schools here picked him up and gave him the resources he needed. He went on to Western Carolina and now works, follows in his mom's footsteps and works for Clear Channel as an account executive. Um, I did continue my broadcasting career here in Western North Carolina for over a decade. I was an honor personality for uh, Clear Channel. I now have my own production and marketing company, and my passion is to grow local business. I had the opportunity to get out and meet a lot of uh, small entrepreneurs, and I really became passionate and wanted to use my creativity to uh, help that. And that's one of the main reasons why I'm running for county commission, because I would like to see our county restored to that affordable place to live where our businesses are once again uh, growing and thriving. And uh, I, I do think that a way to do that is to maybe uh, look at not spending the kind of money that we are so that we can sustain uh, our debt and our people can afford to live here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Byrne. Peterson. Thank you. Um, we appreciate everyone being here tonight, the, the folks who are in attendance, and of course the folks who will uh, be privy to hear this broadcast and uh, read about it in our local papers. My name is Carol Peterson. I'm a Buncombe County native. Um, I come from a family that has been um, interested in public service for decades. I'm a retired school teacher. My husband and I both uh, have worked in both the Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools. I retired as the vocational director for the Asheville City Schools. My husband retired as the principal at Anka High School. My interests are in the field of education. We, we live on a farm, uh, raise pole herford beef cattle. Um, we belong to Central United Methodist Church. I'm on the board of um, trustees at Central Church. I'm on the board of trustees at Asheville Buckham Technical Community College. My husband is on the board at UNC Asheville, so we have some lively educational discussions at our house. I think you can see that one of my prime interests is education. Since I've been on the Board of Commissioners, I have been uh, a person who has pushed the environmental, um, the beauty that we have here in Buncombe County and uh, conservation of land here, the fact that we live on a farm, I realize the importance of, of local food. Uh, my husband's not here tonight because he's actually with our square dance team. We both work with the Mountain Dance and Folk Festival with the Folk Heritage Committee and producing Shindig on the Green. So our dance team is, is practicing tonight, so we're interested in keeping that local culture alive. Um, I'm on the board of Smart Start, um, uh, Juvenile Crime Prevention Committee, and also the Riverfront Redevelopment Commission. I appreciate the work that Mary uh, Lloyd did on this, Mary Leonard did on um, Riverfront Redevelopment. Thank you for being here tonight. Look forward to the questions. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start. We'll start with Ms. Ross. What do you consider the biggest issue facing the county right now, and how would you address it? I think the biggest issue facing the county is the economy. I think, when, and living wage jobs. I will say living wage jobs until Carol's cows come home. <laughs> um, if we have uh, Oakley Elementary School, 85% of the children there are in a reduced or free lunch program. The living wage salary is $9.85 an hour with, with health insurance and $11.35 without. I think that's something we can change and we can work toward. If we have a living wage economy, a lot of problems will diminish. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. Certainly. What do you consider the biggest issue facing the county right now and how would you address it? Well, right now, the county has a lot of issues. They took out a lot of debt during the recession. Uh, and this, as Ms. Ross says, living wage. Well, we need jobs. We need factories in here. Look what we've lost over the years. Ball Brothers, uh, American Inca, or BSAF, whatever you want to call it now. Uh, tons of plants have left, and that was living wage jobs. We're fighting to get stuff back. We want people to work. But the county and the city have to quit putting so many restrictions on people where they cannot be able to bring business in. in the, we need business in the Swallow Valley. Bacon and all of them are gone. So 
business is, is a big thing in there. But when you're going into debt, like this county's gone into debt during this period, when Buncombe County, 13% used to be the number for DSS for food stamps and stuff. In the last three years, it's gone up to 23%. 23% is almost a quarter of Buncombe County on food stamps or, or services uh, from the county. So. The main thing is we need jobs and we need pay, you know taxpayers to pay taxes right, back in. Right. Thank you very much. Ms. Merrill? Um, I definitely agree that we have a lot of citizens who uh, have lost their homes, they've lost their jobs, and one of our biggest exports here in Western North Carolina are educated students. Uh, I myself am an example of putting my sons to college and they've had to go and up to other places to get a job. My son that's a current executive with Clear Channel, that's a that's that's a, a straight commission job, and, and a lot of people that work used to work in those jobs, they made their living off of small businesses, because small businesses need to advertise to grow. But if you can't uh, thrive because of the restrictions, then you can't advertise, and for example, an account executive can't get a job and make a living here, so they have to go down the road to Greenville. So I agree that we need jobs, but in order to do that, we have to grow and support our local businesses, and when we bring in new jobs, we need to make sure that they're also high quality jobs, not just one particular industry. We need, we need jobs for uh, not only our graduates of our four-year universities, but our, our tech students as well. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Thank you for the question. I, I think there's no question that the biggest need that we have here is good paying jobs for our citizens. And that ties in directly to having an, an educational system here that helps people be uh, prepared for the jobs that do come in. Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College does a great job if when new business are, businesses are coming into Buncombe County, uh, making sure that they have the um, skills that they need in order to uh, in order to do those jobs so jobs in and hand in glove with an educational institution that works nicely thank you all right thank you we will start with you mr fryer do you consider yourself a progressive why or why not <laughs> no i'm not a progressive <laughs> i'm kind of conservative because on the progressive side, I see that, you know, conservatives want to protect water. They want to protect everything, air, you know. But no, uh, there's too many things that happen on the progressive side. You know, everybody wants walkways. Everybody wants these ways. Everybody wants greenways. Everybody's wants. I have children. And every now and then I have to tell them, no, you can't have that candy because we do not have the money for it. So. Uh, being stable and doing the right things, but when it gets to the point we do not have money to be able to do so, then the wants have to stop. So that's what I mean. Thank you, Ms. Merrill. I'm glad that, that this question was asked because uh, most people know I am a fiscal conservative, but that doesn't, I, I really, and most people I know are really tired of the labels. And, you know, there's a lot of things about me and about the people that I know that some people might call progressive. I love the arts. I'm a painter. I think that that's one of the things that has drawn people to Western North Carolina and Nashville are, are the arts. And I think there's a stigma that if you're conserv conservative fiscally, that you can't appreciate the same things that someone who, who might be an independent or, or a different party affiliation. And that's not necessarily true. I'm going to stand strong on my fiscal uh, ground, but there's a lot more to being a conservative fiscal uh, candidate than the stereotype. So I, I just wanted to clarify that. Ms. Peterson. Uh, very good question. I, I spoke to a friend not too many days ago, Dwight Buckner, um, downtown. He said, Carol, I am um, going to be a member of a group that's called the No Labels Group. And that's, I, I'm, I'm sort of interested in that. I think we are to the point that we're putting labels on people about everything. I'm progressive about things, I, some things. I'm conservative about some things. And I think what you're looking for in a county commissioner is a person who can look at the situation and depending on that situation, uh, make make the decision that that is is needed in that particular situation. Progressive about some things, conservative about some things. 
But let's go to no labels. I like that a bunch. All right, thank you. Ms. Ross. I think um, <clears throat> some of my employees might say that I'm extremely conservative sometimes when it comes to giving races. I think others might think I'm as liberal as can be. I think I have very strong core values that want children not to have to worry about eating, the children to go to a safe school where they're not discriminated against. So when they leave school, they can have jobs. If that calls me a progressive, so be it. If that calls me a conservative, uh, so be it. But I kind of agree about the no labels. Thank you. All right, we're going to start with you, Ms. Miro. This is a multi-part question, so we'll try and get it all in. Would you support adding sexual orientation and gender identity to the county's non-discrimination clause? Would you support offering domestic partner benefits to county employees? If not, what should the county do to protect the rights of LGBT citizens? Okay, so on the first part of that question, would I support a change in the current, uh, would you support adding sexual orientation and gender identity to the county's non-discrimination clause? Okay, well, I, I absolutely don't think that anyone should be bullied or discriminate, discriminated against in any workplace for any reason whatsoever. But I do believe that the county has a very uh, comprehensive clause that is anti, for anti-discrimination that covers that. And the second part of the question? Would you support offering domestic partner benefits to county employees? Again, being a fiscal conservative, if we extend benefits to non-married people, it will cost our taxpayers and our citizens more money. So for that reason, I would not support it. Thank you. The first question. Um, it, I think it's important for folks to know that we do have a non-discriminatory ordinance um, in, in the Buckingham County personnel policy. And we have an open door policy that any, any a uh, person who is employed by Buncombe County can uh, report any type of discrimination to the manager. And, and I think that that's well known throughout our, our county workforce. And if someone is within the hearing of my voice thinks that, that there is discrimination going on with them and they're an county employee, I, I urge them not to, not to break stride getting to the county manager and, and telling that manager about that. The second part of the question, um, this is a very controversial, complex, and sensitive issue. Very complex. And I am not in favor of adding domestic partner benefits to the county personnel policy. Thank you. Ms. Ross? Yes and yes. Uh, I would support adding discrimination clause because if it's not an issue, then it won't come up. But I think we have to protect employees from ever feeling that they're discriminated against. As far as domestic partnerships benefits, yes. Uh, the city of Charlotte grants domestic partner benefits, and guess how many they grant? There's a total of seven. Um, I think it's a very clear issue, and I'm fully supportive of it. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. No, I'm the first, uh, you know, because they do have things in place as far as this, and it goes back to the same thing, you're talking about discrimination. Many years ago, I was talking to a gentleman that ran the Wachovia Bank, and his words to me was, you know, I said, well, what about if you want to fire a woman? He said, well, if you want to fire a woman or a black man or a white woman, you have to have six months' worth of documentations. I said, well, how long does it take to fire a woman? for a white guy, he said, in the morning. So, no, they have protections. And uh, a lot of things, I've got 30 seconds, but a lot of things my brother, Art Fryer, ran a club called Scandals, which you understand. And it was gay, and he wanted his own, you know, he didn't want anything from anyone. He said he was the way he wanted to be. He did not want to get married, and he didn't need anything from anyone. So. And as far as domestic partnerships, it's no on that too because that goes back to the same thing. You know, if there's two people the same gender, they should be able to afford their own insurance. All right, thank you, sir. We will start with you, Ms. Peterson. What is the role of the county in creating jobs? Would you support tax incentives to more business? The role of the county in, in creating jobs is to work um, hand in glove with the um, 
Asheville Area Chamber of Commerce, which we do through our Economic Development Incentives Program. I do support incentives. I think it's important for, that. that's really the name of the game as far as bringing um, jobs into the county. You, you have to have um, reasons for the folks to come. You know, if, if you go to South Carolina or other, other states that border us or other counties within North Carolina, 30 seconds. I, that the name of the game is the incentive package. We have a very strict incentive package in Buncombe County. The, the folks who get the incentives who come here with their businesses adhere to certain rules and regulations that are set out before them. If they do not meet those rules and regulations, there's what we call a clawback phase, meaning that, that the incentive that was promised to them, they do not get, and we keep very strict um, tabs on that. But yes, I do support incentives. Working with the chamber is is very important. Um, All right, thank you, thank you, Mr. Ms. Brooks, can you repeat the question? What is the role of the county in creating jobs, and would you support tax incentives to your business to the county? I think a county commission or county government has a key role in job creation. You know, one of the ways we do it is by making Buncombe County as attractive as possible. We you know New Belgium came here because of our lifestyle, our greenways, and incentives. I think tax incentives are a natural follow. We have to do everything we can to make ourselves as attractive to promote Buncombe County. Uh, we know it's a beautiful place, and it's going to stay beautiful by job creation, and yes, they do support incentives. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. I do support one incentive. When the county comes, the first thing the county has to do is, you know, restrictions and rules. You know, we've got to back off, you know, some of the restrictions to bring business. When you bring business, you give them an incentive of a tax break. You don't hand them dollars and cents. If they put so many people to work over a certain percentage of years, then they then they'll have their total tax break. But if they don't, you back it up. If they say they're going to hire 400 and they only hire 200, then you have to go back and take some of the break away from them and their, their property taxes and stuff would go up at that point. So if they come and they bring jobs and it works, say 10 years, uh, no property tax, at least it's not $8 million out of our pocket. Ms. Merrill? We are a county of small businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs in, in Buncombe County and I have spent my career in Western North Carolina working with small businesses, and there is a resentment that incentives are going to outside businesses to bring them here. And I think that if there's going to be an incentive plan or program, it needs to also include our current businesses. We have to grow our businesses in Western North Carolina. There's a, a breweries in, in Western North Carolina that were, that were started here that have grown here, that employ people here, and when you give an outside brewery money to come here to compete with, with that brewery that was already here and, and, and thriving, you know, they can put them out of business. So we, we need to be careful that we're not putting our, our entrepreneurs out of business. And if we're gonna offer incentives, they need to be across the board. We need to support all of the businesses. Thank you. All right, we will start with you, Ms. Bronx, on this one. Would you support green job creation to help build the economy while preserving our environment and what time? It, this is a, a, a no-brainer. Um, we love our environment. We want to keep everything as it is. Um, that might be a conservative value. Um, then we certainly want to um, encourage green technology. And I remember somebody from the Sierra Club said to me, you know, how would you convince someone in a more conservative part of the county that green energy was good and green job creation was good. I said as soon as they got their first living wage paycheck from installing solar panels, we would have more people on board. Um, we, we need to, again, change the paradigm and encourage green, green jobs. Absolutely. Would you support green job creation to help build the economy while preserving our environment in what type? Green jobs are probably good in their own ways, but other jobs are, are, are better at the present time. I have a friend who put a quarter million dollars worth of solar panels on the roof of his building. Got the big tax break and the big money. But uh, 
He was getting like 12 cents from the power company, but now it's down to two and a half cents per kilowatt. So he says it's not that beneficial at the present time, but you know, and we um, who have the hybrid cars understand that. Now hopefully we have some oxygen cars, but we got a lot of natural gas. But the main thing is we got to get some of the, the gas down. And the environment, I love there. The trees in there, they love carbon monoxide. They grow big and a lot of leaves fall off of it. So that's what makes our, so. Right. Ms. Merrill? Can you repeat the question, please? Would you support green job creation to help build the economy while preserving our environment? What type? I think that green jobs are, are definitely a good thing and, and preserving the economy is a good thing, but I think that you need to look at uh, the benefit before putting a green job over another job that's quote unquote not green. You know, look at, at you know, which area is, is better to put the energy uh, or or manpower into and make sure that it's 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 the best thing for the county and, and take it on a case by case basis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Thank you. Um, I definitely support green jobs. I think that this this is another time when you have to have a balance in what you do. And, and I, I think that you could look to what county government's done in the past few years as far as green jobs are concerned. And the lead certification, for example, that we're going to have on the new courts building that's being built right now. Um, the, the situation that we have at our Buncombe County landfill and the number of homes that are, the number of homes that are being served by electricity that's being generated from the gas from our landfill. The kinds of things that Buckham County government is doing uh, stands as a good example of green jobs and, and I think that's very important. Thank you. Right, thank you. We'll start with you, Mr. Fryer. Our mountains drop tourists and new residents. Lots of high-end developments are being built just outside the city limits to avoid taxes. We see what happens when bubbles collapse, the county streams are impacted, property values go down. Do you support long-range planning to protect the beauty and the financial viability of the county and the region? That's the heart of the question. Well, yes, there was a lot of boondoggles in the mountains around here. and uh, But everything was great. Everybody said everything was going to stay great in the actual area when, when, when homes started going down. But developers tried people, you know, and the government were letting people buy these homes with basically no money down. And so it's not all the people's fault, it's not all the developers' fault. I do want the mountains to stay good, but I want I do believe in the property owners having the rights to do with their property as they see fit, not what county people or the board says that they can do with them. I sat and watched some people that wanted an affordable home, like a $36,000 trailer on Grandpa's lot and uh, two and a half acres, and they got turned down because uh, the board decided they didn't want that there. So that's, that, that was only affordable housing they had. Ms. Um, that was a very long question. Can we'll just get to the heart of the question. Do you support sure. long-range planning to protect the beauty and the financial viability of the county in the region? Uh, this is an area that, that is of concern uh, for many of our county citizens in, in being micromanaged and government trying to control and take over everything. I think that we need to allow people to have property as a source of freedom. We need to allow development to occur <coughs> organically and not try and have uh, the government's hand on everything. If it's something that is impacting um, the, the environment in a, in a detrimental way, you know, we, we do already have certain uh, restrictions in place that would handle that. But any more government right now control is probably not something our county residents are looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. And would you repeat the discussion? Do you support any long range planning to protect the beauty and the financial viability of the county and the region? Yes. Would you like to expand? Well, we have um, many um, great county plans in the works. Of course, we have our, our zoning regulations, and which have, have um, been received very nicely once folks realize that zoning is in place for the good of the folks who live in the county. You've got to have that long-range plan. 
Uh, we have, we're looking at a greenways plan. I, I realize that there are um, lots of obstacles that need to, to uh, be solved before that's put into place. Uh, and we want to go more to the citizens for that. But you have to have long range plans. That's, that's why you have folks elected to office to, to be with the citizens and hear their concerns and make decisions based on, on what they're sharing with you. But definitely long range plans, definitely. Thank you, Ms. Frost. Do you need me to read the question? I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly we need a long-range plan. We need a long-range plan for a lot of areas. And um, I think, again, we, need, we also, with that long-range plan, we need community input. Uh, when I go out and speak to voters, uh, especially people, whether they have a $100,000 home or a $500,000 home or renting with aspirations of having a home, they want to know wherever they invest in, it's going to be protected. And these are not restrictions or protections. Thank you. All right, we're going to start with you, Ms. Merrill. And this uh, relates, actually, the next question to part of Ms. Peterson's answer. Do you support a bond referendum to voters to pay for the development of greenways in the county? And would you support the use of eminent domain to acquire property for the greenway? Uh, there's a long and a short answer to that. I'll try and get the one answer. Uh, we have a, a city of Asheville that already has greenways. We've, we've uh, created lots of parks. We have wonderful schools. One of the reasons given I was at the Board Commission meeting uh, to develop the greenways outside the city and throughout the entire county uh, was that our children are obese, and this would give them the opportunity to go run around on the greenways. Well, we have great places to run. We have neighborhoods where kids can ride their bikes. We have schools. We have sports programs. You go to any uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, and you will see hundreds of kids out on the soccer and football fields. So spending $40 million and taxing our citizens for greenways right now when our families are losing their homes and struggling to make ends meet, to me, does not make sense whatsoever. Thank you. Ms. Peterson? Do you mind repeating the question? Absolutely. Do you support putting a public referendum to voters to pay for the development of greenways in the county? And do you support the use of eminent domain to acquire property for um, greenways? Answer the second part of the question. First, uh, as a board of commissioners, we put into the adoption of the greenway plan, and, and let me underline the term plan, that we would not um, ask to have em em eminent domain. <laughs> to acquire any of the properties. I, I want to, to say very strongly that this is a plan, it's a recommendation from a group that worked about a year and a half on the plan. Um, we also have a plan for an aquatic center. We have a plan to spruce up Lake Julian. We have a plan to work on the sports park. Let me say that these are plans. My, my thought is that our parks, recreation, and greenway uh, staff, and, and we've talked to them about this, need to come back with some priority, <coughs> priorities in order, speak to citizens, see what kinds of things the, the community is interested, interested in our parks, recreations, and greenways department doing. Bond referendum at this time, no ma'am. I think the greenways are a wonderful aspiration, and again, I think we need to have community input um, and make sure that it's a buy-in from all communities, and no, I would never support um, taking property through have no domain for that. Thank you. Right, Mr. Fryer? No. Uh, it's real simple. It goes back to the candy. We're $400 million of debt bill in this county. Once you add to AV Tech, $137 million. So how can we drive it up? And they say it won't be 40 it'll be 70 or $100 million for for these greenways because you're looking at trying to buy people's property. I want to remember, that's like Christina said, simple fact is we have all these sports complexes. You can go to them. This greenway is not going to be in anybody's backyard. But I'll tell you one little story. I asked the Motor Speedway. I make 62000 a year down there. Uh, it's a greenway now. And And uh, the gentleman had it to last year. It's 27 weeks, 98,000 paid people come in to watch race cars. You show me another place in this area that can bring that many people into 27 weeks. So, no, I'm, 
I'm, I'm getting a little old to walk from Fairview down the mountain. I have to put some stops going back up if I have to walk up. All right, we're going to start with Ms. Peterson. So many of our children do not have enough food to eat. Other than that food bank, what can the county do? Well, I'm, I'm, it is a huge responsibility. Is we, we need to make sure that our children are well fed and, and they need to not have to worry about that. We need to, to work with our school system. We need to, I'd like you to know that during the summer, there was a summer feeding program where Buncombe County Parks and Rec and the Buncombe County Schools and some of the other organizations in Buncombe County worked to feed about 20,000 students or 20,000 children per day. That's one thing that we, we can work with our partnering agencies to look at the problem and bring uh, like minds together to solve it. But it is a great problem and we do need to have everyone work on it. And I will say that program we're speaking of was federally funded other than the small $200 yes. Yes. Uh, Before we go to you, I just want to remind people, if you have a question and you need a card, just raise your hand, we'll bring you a card, and then once you write your question down, hold the card up, and we'll collect it and it will be brought to me. Ms. Frost, what can the county do regarding the uh, food insecurity and health of our children? Well, I'm going to go back to living with jobs um, as a long-term solution to this horrible, horrible problem. Um, when we say those numbers and we think of those children, we need to personalize it a little bit more to think it's somebody's daughter, somebody's son, somebody's grandson. And I think the county has done an admirable job so far, but while we still have existing children that are hungry when they go to school and have to participate in the backpack problem, we need to do more. We need to exhaust every possible resource with local business, extending more community partnerships that Buncombe County has already done and extending more. This has to be a top, top priority. And again, also working hand in hand with creating living wage jobs. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. I don't think children should be fed. But the simple fact is, you know, we are in bad times and we are spending 25% of our DSS money on families. Uh, what are these people doing with these food stamps and stuff they're getting for these poor children? Are they buying drugs with them? What, what's going on here? Simple fact is, I want every child to eat, but when I got married, I decided two children was enough for me that I, that's all I could afford. That's what I had. So we're subsidizing a lot of people that have a lot of children, and they get a whole lot of money in subsidy, and then we're still feeding them. Something's not right about the program. We need to look at the program. I want every child to eat, but I want us to look at the programs that's out there. I come up very poor as an orphan, and the simple fact is I ate. It might have been blown, it might have been pinto beans, but uh, I don't want anyone to starve. But it's the responsibility of people to learn how many people that they can afford to support. And we will state that the food stamp program is a federal federal program. Just the food stamp program is a federal program. It's not administered by the county. Just I, I know, just letting the folks know it's not a, a, a an expense of the county directly. Uh, Ms. Mel? Uh, yeah, this has been an increasing problem in, in Buncombe County and probably, I would imagine, statewide and nationally. And it is heartbreaking to see a child hungry. I not only am a parent of two grown sons, but I have a nine-year-old daughter. And throughout the entire time that my children were growing up in the Buncombe County school systems, I've been on those ball fields and I've coached uh, kids and I've seen kids come to to the, the ball field uh, starving and not eat, having anything to eat all day or all weekend. And, you know, I as a parent and um, county commissioner would support anything that we can do to help feed our, our children. And I think one of the best things we can do is put our parents back to work. And in order to put our parents back to work, we need uh, to make sure that we're bringing in the kind of variety of jobs and um, giving them opportunities, growing our small businesses. I think it goes back to, it will always go back to putting people back to work. But in the meantime, we, we absolutely need to take care of our, of our children. Thank you. All right, we're going to start, uh, you answered the question, I apologize. We're going to start with Ms. Frost. There is a perception of conflict between the rural areas and our cities. What is your perception of the city-county divide? 
and do cities endanger rural areas economically and or socially? I think there's a perception of, by a small bubble of people, that there is disenfranchisement between the city and the county. Um, and we can fall into that old trap. There's a wonderful non-for-profit called Code for America. They go around the country and they solve these sorts of um, issues of lack of sharing of data, or they call it sharing data. Um, they come up with innovative ways to create more partnerships between cities and counties. Buncombe County is not unique to this. Um, at any time, we approach any relationship with, oh, we have a problem with them, it's never going to go far. We have to remember that Asheville, in many accounts, is an economic driver for the county, and the county drives the city of Asheville by subsidizing their businesses. Thank you, Mr. Fryer. There was a perception of conflict between rural areas and the cities. What is your perception of the city-county divide, and do cities endanger rural areas economically and or socially? The only way that they endanger them is annexation. That is, uh, that, that was a big issue. Now I got involved, got around politics in 2004. That's endangerment. Then you have an ETJ, extraterritorial area, one mile outside the cities that they can control, but the people don't have a vote. So yes, there is areas, but there is areas in the city and county that we that we should be trying to combine, like the parks and recs and other things like that, that that would would benefit all. But you know, simple fact is there is when the annexation thing. Uh, when they had the tool in the toolbox, they used it very wisely. And, and, uh, when I got annexed, the gentleman told me, this was his words, Mr. Shuford said, I said, why are you doing this? And I said, I just have one portion. He said, well, wait, just think this, as a city, as a business. And when it needs money, it has to do whatever it needs to do to get it. So I have a bad taste for annexation over that. Thank you. Ms. Merrill, can you repeat the question, please? There is perception of conflict between the rural areas and our cities. What is your perception of the city-county divide, and do cities endanger rural areas economically and or socially? Um, yeah, that was cities plural, and I think the only differences I've seen mainly would be between the city of Asheville and, and the entire county, and I think there's a lot of people who live outside the city limits that feel that they haven't had a voice on, on the commission to represent their different needs than someone who might live within the city limits. So that's been a bit of a divide, and it, I think the districting will give us that opportunity to have a balance on the county commission. And I think balance is a good thing. We are a community that is a, a, a tapestry of different people, and we should have different perspectives on that commission. One area I think that we can be proactive and work together um, as a county and a city to uh, save our taxpayers some money is we have the, the city school systems and the county school systems, and we're sort of doubling up on a lot of um, uh, budget areas, and I think that we might be able to uh, integrate those two and work more efficiently as a, as a county as a whole. Thank you. Ms. Peterson. One more time, a question, please. There's perception of conflict between the rural areas and our cities. What's your perception of the city-county divide? Do cities endanger rural areas economically and or socially? Well, number one, you've got to look at Buncombe County as a total unit. And within that total unit, you have not only Asheville, but you have four other municipalities. The one that we're sitting in right here, Black Mountain. Um, and you need to look at what each one of those municipalities brings to the total county tapestry, as uh, Ms. Merrill said. And I think we need to embrace those differences um, rather than trying to add more division to that. You, you need to look at Buncombe County not only as involving folks who, who live on a farm or folks who live on Broadway or folks who are small business owners or folks who have moved in here for retirement, but you need to look at the total population in Buncombe County and look at us as a total unit. This is another, another place where I, it really bothers me that folks want to think there's a divide between Buncombe County government and the city of Asheville. 
And if there's one group that we work very closely with, with as commissioners, that's Thank our Asheville City Council. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, I've been asked and I'm going to go ahead and grant 30 seconds more for, for anyone who is. I think as long as we continue to divide, we are never going to progress. When we look at Buncombe County in its totality, it's an extraordinary place. It's an extraordinary place because it embraces so many differences. And we have to applaud those differences and not let them divide us. Anybody else like any more time on that? Mr. Barish? Uh, well, the city says that the county comes, Asheville City, Asheville City, not Black Mountain. Asheville City says that the county comes in and uses their resources. Well, Asheville is 33% of Buncombe County. They use 47% of the DSS. 61% of the people in jail in Buncombe County are from the city of Asheville. So, you know, uh, I think we try to help, as, as uh, Ms. Peterson says, we're trying to help the city people too. Ms. Merrill, do you have? Yeah, I, I was thinking about something that Nathan Ramsey said earlier. I think that it's very important, regardless of party affiliation, to have reasonable people elected to our county commission uh, that can work across party lines to, to solve problems for our citizens of our entire county. So that, that's going to be really important in this election, is to have uh, people that can work together <coughs> to solve some of these problems. Just one more thought about that. Everyone, if, if you live in the city of Asheville or in Black Mountain, you are a Buckham County resident. I think folks tend, tend to forget that everyone who lives in Buckham County is a Buckham County resident. And the core services that Buckham County provides Health and Human Services, uh, funding, education, safety, all those are, are used by every citizen of Buncombe County. So if you live in Black Mountain, if you live in Weaverville, if you live in Montreal, if you live in Portmore Forest, regardless of which one of the cities you, municipalities you live in, you are a resident of Buncombe County, and that's when you stand up and you're proud. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. We have two main questions, and we will start with Mr. Fryer. Regarding the redistricting done by the state legislature, where parts of the county were carved up to benefit certain representatives, this is the question, uh, how can counties and citizens be heard by the state to reverse this trend? I think what they want to know is, is what can be done for citizens to be heard on redistricting? Can, can the process be changed? Is there a way? From what I understand in the process, is supposedly, maybe I'm totally wrong, it's either a 10 or 20 year, uh, it's put out there. So with the it, census, yes, sir, you're right. Uh, it's done with the census, so you're correct. Right. And, uh, so we're going to be the same, and then the people, of, the people of Buncombe County can make a decision whether they like the way that we're doing. Uh, they put it on a four year, two year, so anybody up here, the first person that you, the person that gets the most votes out of us four will have four years. The person that gets the second amount of votes will have a two year. And in two years, they will have to, uh, the person that finishes second, if they want to rerun, have to rerun. So it's going to be alternate elections after uh, this election. But I, I personally, uh, it's, I don't think my district, uh, this district two is broken up to help one or the other, it's very close uh, party to party in this district. So it's just the people we need to be working for. We don't need to worry about the party. And the election is different this time because we have added seats to the Buckham County Commission Board uh, as put into effect by the legislature this past session. Ms. Merrill, can you repeat the whole question? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the redistricting done by the state, I'll read it exactly, uh, where parts of the county were carved out. Can, uh, how can counties and citizens be heard by the state to reverse this trend? I, I think what they're trying to get at is, is there a better process or does this process work? I think this is a, a good process. I think this is an opportunity to give all county citizens a vote in, in uh, electing their commissioners. And the other good thing about it too is, is if you have a commissioner elected from your part of, of the county, you're going to have someone that's invested in your community that knows what's going on you know, in the eastern part of the county versus uh, the western part of the county. So I think that it's going to give people the opportunity to have more personal, um, uh, personal relationship 
with their representatives. And, and once once elected, you know, you work with your county commissioners to do the best to represent all people of the county. I don't, I think that the, the way the system is set up right now is probably a fair one, and um, I think it's a, a good opportunity for our citizens. Ms. Peterson. I'm just gonna jump right in and not ask you to repeat it. I'd, I'd like to say again that Buckham County Commissioner work is countywide. Regardless of whether you run for and are fortunate to be elected from District 2 or District 1, District 3, regardless of the district, the work that you do, the decisions that you make are countywide decisions. Now, you, you are going to listen. I, if I'm lucky enough to get elected, if someone in the Etha Candler area comes to me with a situation they want me to, to hear from them, there's no question I'm going to do that. If someone from Black Mountain does that, I'm going to do that. That's no different from what you do if you're elected to countywide office, and that, that's what county commissioning is. As far as how you can reverse this, a lot of decisions that are, can, that are made can be reversed at the ballot box. So if, if you do not like the way um, the state legislature decided that this county commission at the local level was going to be elected,